demarcation point. This is a new concept for most of you, but there are elements of, of your ISP that brings equipment. Whenever they bring equipment to your business, there is a demarcation point. And generally, it's going to be in your MDF, your main distribution facility, where your telecom connects or your Bright House brings their interface boxes or their communication equipment. All of that's going to be brought into typically a, a wall that's going to have plywood mounted against the wall. That demarcation point belongs to the ISP. Don't mess with it. This concept is very important. Here's a demarcation point at home. This is um, a telephone provider that's providing equipment. They mount it on the side of the, the house. You don't touch this. This belongs to the provider. And that's going to be true with even a small business. So just be aware. Demarcation is a very important concept. Don't mess with their equipment. In your house, you may have a cable interface box. This is typically what, what I have in my house. Uh, this is not mine. This belongs to the cable company. This is a demarcation point. If I destroy it, I pay for it. Here's another example. Verizon is bringing fiber to homes. Again, a uh, box on the wall, uh, wires, cables mounted to the side of the home or a business. This doesn't belong to you. This is a demarcation point. This equipment belongs to the provider. Here's what it looks like in a small business. Notice you got a wall dedicated to the ISP providers, telecom, cable, whatever they are. They generally can mount their equipment, their patch panels, their interface boxes, etc. That wall belongs to them. That equipment belongs to them. Don't mess with it. You will pay for it if you do. Here's an example of fiber optics uh, interface box. It's brought right to the side of a building, mounted on the wall. The ISP brings their fiber optics, terminates it, expands it, whatever, brings it into a patch bay or distribution system. Again, this does not belong to you. Leave it alone. That is their stuff. So this slide quickly just brings us back and reviews some of the logical components of home devices. You've got routers, firewalls, NATs, DHCP servers. You've got WAPs. All of this are the logical components. You've got your switch built in. This is your typical home stuff. So a quick review of logical components. There's a firewall. There's a router inside. There is network address translation services provided. There's DHCP provided that provides IP addresses to your IP address information to your home network hosts and devices. You have a WAP included and typically a network switch. Now there's generally, depending on the SOHO home router system that you buy, you may have more logical components than this, but this is your typical. Leaving the home systems to more in enterprise type devices is where we are headed. So let's put away the home devices and let's get started learning the enterprise devices. So what are some of the things that begin to separate the home devices from the more enterprise small business devices? Well, obviously, number one would be price and the components that are provided, the flexibility, the more enterprise grade elements. This is the Cisco 1841. It's a very popular what they call an integrated router. Let's take a look at some of the functions and see immediately there's a big difference between what we have at home and what we're going to have at business. This particular router starts off with Ethernet WAN ports, just like most home router systems that you buy for your house. Most of them connect to the ISP via uh, Ethernet. So if that's going to be provided to you, and that's very common today, you have those Ethernet connections for your WAN ports. And notice you have two of them, so you could have dual functionality, you could have failover, so very nice. It also provides what they call high-speed WAN interface slot card. If you live in some areas of the United States, you're not going to be able to get Ethernet WAN. You're going to have to have maybe access to Frame Relay or T1 services from your local PSTN ISP. So they have slots here, and notice you can unscrew them and replace this one with this one here, which is an, an ADSL module, more of a DSL type environment. Uh, so you're going to have more flexibility. So no matter where you are in the country, and no matter what your ISP provider is, you're going to have the interface for their WAN connection. Because this is a Cisco device, it's most likely going to run the Cisco iOS rather than Linux, although there's nothing wrong with Linux. This has a compact flash module for extra functionality and, and memory storage. 
This has a more serious Ethernet switch, and we'll see that as we get into it, and a single port USB, single slot USB port. The router we're going to use in our lab is going to be a Cisco router. It's going to be the RV082, and it actually uses embedded Linux. And this is the actual cover taken off. This is the one you're going to use in your labs, and this is the inside. So it's a lot more serious integrated circuits and design than your typical home router. It's going to have a lot of the same things. It's going to have firewall, a router, a NAT, DHCP service. It's also going to have VPN capabilities. Or, and you're going to have to add, notice the component of WAP is not included. So you're going to have to get your own WAP, which is good, and, uh, and probably add a network switch to extend your network to other users. Firewalls are critical components of your business network. The firewall position in the network logical structure is going to be right at the WAN point. So you're going to bring your WAN into your firewall and then your firewall to your, your integrated router. So this is typically the logical position for it. So here's where we begin to see the breaking apart of logical functions into individual appliances. This is a Juniper firewall, and it's a very serious, lots of functionality, great speed. Uh, it actually has VPN services, a web interface to configure and set up your, your firewall. You can see here we've got a lot of flexibility. We have a, a replaceable module, so we could we can handle a T1E1 from our WAN provider. We could pop this module out, put an Ethernet connection in. If our WAN is being brought to us via Ethernet, we have that flexibility. So these are serious firewalls, expensive but not outrageous. There are obviously much more expensive, much more complex firewalls available to the enterprise. Here's an example of where we really put the mesh network or the mesh topology to work. So here's a small business that's going to bring in two internet providers, say a PSTN ISP here, and say a cable company that's going to provide them internet. And let's say they depend mostly on the cable company. They get a better price, they get a higher speed. But they're going to, they're going to also contract with a PSTN ISP to bring in a backup. So here they're going to have firewall routers at, at uh, each one of those ISP incoming connections. And then they'll do the mesh where they will set up a automatic failover should one ISP or one device fail. Uh, they can be automatically switched over and their business can always stay up, at least guaranteeing them a much higher uptime than if they were dependent on only one ISP and one piece of equipment. So here you can really begin to see some of the redundancy and here you begin to see also that mesh topology that you see a lot in NetPlus. In your labs for this entire session, we're going to be using the Cisco RV082. This is a very powerful integrated router with a web interface for most of its functionality. It's run on Linux and it's, it's a great way to get started in a business environment. It's got two WAN ports for uh, redundancy and failover and we're going to set that up and see how that works. It's very interesting and that's typical in a business environment to WAN ports that can be used for multiple things, but one of them is redundancy. In your labs, our network, the OCPS network, is going to be your ISP. And so we're gonna connect our network here at the school right up to one of the WAN ports, possibly two of them, as we test out the functionality of redundancy. But at least one of them is gonna be connected to our network, which is OCPS. You're going to get an IP address from our network, which is uh, based on our DHCP scope, which is from 1029.128.something to 1029.142. So you'll get an, an IP address in that area. The router that you're going, the next router that you're going to connect to, will be 1029.128.1. Your subnet mask, subnet mask will be 255. 255240.0. This will be your lab WAN. This will be your lab WAN. Typically, you're only going to get one IP address, except in the time that you actually do the dual WAN, you're going to get two IP addresses. Your local area network on this router is going to be typically 192.168.1.1. That's going to be the internal router interface. 
you're going to have a DHCP server and it's going to lease, start leasing IP addresses at about 100. Your subnet mask is going to be 255.255.255.0. So this is the LAN and that is the WAN. And we're going to see that over and over in all of our labs. So I want to begin to show you how the, because you're going to see some really strange IP addresses. The, the demo that I'm doing for this video is at home. So I don't have access to the OCPS network like you will when you get to school and do your labs. So what I had to do was I had to do some strange stuff in order to get this to work. So I want you to understand the demo, what I'm doing at home. So as you watch the video and the demonstrations, that hopefully they will make sense to you. So here's my home router and I'm bringing in Brighthouse into my internet connection and my my uh, network is going to be a 192.168.1.100 uh, leasing. In other words, we're going to start leasing IP addresses at 192.168.1.100. The router interface for my home network is 192.168.1.1 and the subnet is 255.255.255. Now this home network is really going to be my Cisco RB082's ISP. So my, my demo, when I talk about the local area network, when I look at the output of these switches and the IP addresses they're going to get, they're going to get a different subnet. So I set up this router. So they're going to get 172.16.0.1. And we're going to lease IP addresses starting at 100. Our subnet mask is 255.255.255.0. And the router for my home network on the RV082 is going to be 172.16.0.1. I had to do it this way in order to make it work. So let me show you how I connected it. Again, Bright House brings internet connection. And I get the typical subnet that most of you do at home. Then I had to take an Ethernet cable and bring it into the WAN port of my RV082. And so my home network really is my ISP. The, the subnet and the IP addresses and router IPs are going to seem a little bit strange. But since my home is the ISP, it's going to be that way. Now all the recording of the video is going to be, I've got a computer here and I'm going to connect it via Ethernet cable to the switch port on the RV082. So I'm going to get IP addresses, something like 172.16.0.100, 102, 103, depending on what my uh, computer will pull. And I'll have a subnet of 255.255.255.0. And the router that does all my work will be 172.16.0.1. Notice these, I'm using those private IP addresses that are available to anyone. If you look closely at this, I'm actually daisy chaining one router into another. And believe it or not, it works. Now, let me give you some caveats. Because this is a business class router, it allows me to use the 172.16.0.1. Most home routers do not allow you to change the private IP address range of your home network. So that is the only reason I'm able to daisy chain one router right into another. If you want to do this at home, you can, but you will have to take your firmware and blow it away and use DDWRT, which is a uh, open source firmware for routers. And that is the only way because most home routers will not allow you to use this scope of IPs for your LAN, your local area network. So in my case, it worked because I have a more expensive router and it does support using other IP ranges. I would like you to stop and think about it. Look at the connection. Make sure you understand it. Come talk with your instructor. Anything you don't understand in what we've just shared in the last two slides, stop and clarify. So let's take a look at what it really looks like. 
so it will help you better understand all the demos that I'm going to be doing. First of all, Brighthouse brings in their ISP, in, uh, ISP Ethernet connection to my home. That becomes my WAN router interface and subnet. Then on the other side of my home router, it's all 192.168.1. something. Okay, my routers dot one. I start leasing IP addresses at 100, etc. Then out of my switch or my wireless access point, you pull an IP address. So everyone on my home is 192.168.1. something. Okay, I'm going to take a switch port and I'm going to bring it over to the input of the router for the RV082 router network. And so this IP address right here is going to be part of my network, 192.168.1. something, 100, 101, 102. So my home network is going to be the ISP for the RV082. On the other side, we're going to use the private IP addresses of 172.16.0. something. And the router will be dot one and I'll start leasing IP addresses at say 100. Very similar to this one except we're using a different range of IP addresses. Out of the switch from that router will go into my demo PC which I'm going to video and record everything. And we're going to go constantly into the interface of this router right here. And you're going to see this work. So the RV082 network will be 172.16. And our ISP will be a 192.168.1. That's going to be different when you get to your lab because this will be a 10.29 network from Orange County Public Schools. So at home, I now have a PC right here and I'm connected into my WAN. And I should be pulling this type of IP addressing from my RV082. This is daisy chained into my home router and this is Bright House. So this will all be 192.168 stuff out here on my home network in the RV082 will be 172.16.1. Here's my network connection dialog box, my uh, control panel network and sharing center. Here's my uh, Ethernet card that's plugged into the RV082. Let's go look at properties. I'm sorry, the details. And you can see I've pulled an IP address of 172.16.0.101. So the DHCP server on the RV082 is working fine. It's given me an IP address. So when I look at all of this, remember this is looking at the LAN side of the RV082 network. I can see my my default, my router is the 172.16.0.1. I've been given DHCP, uh, DNS services, and I have an IP address and a subnet mask. And so I'm ready to go. So on my demo machine, I have launched my browser, and you can see it here. You can see that I've went to the IP address of my local area network router, which is 172.